Hello, everyone, and good afternoon to you all and warm welcome from the Kaimur Global Center today to our fourth installment of the Kaimur Book Club. My name is Lisa Caulfield and I'm the director of the Notre Dame Global Center located here at Kaimur Abbey in County Galway. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, um, this series, I'd like to extend a warm Keed Mila Falcha, which is a warm welcome um, on behalf of, of uh, you joining us here in Ireland. And to those regulars and friends of Carmel, it's great to see you again. So thanks for joining. This week, we start a new series entitled Anticipatory Innovation, Capitalizing on Change in Turbulent Times. Um, we're gonna talk about, you know, what is the new normal or, or a return to, nor to normal, but has the way we changed, um, has changed the way we work forever. We're gonna talk about the future uh, in a post pandemic. Uh, and when we do talk about the future, do we talk about it as a return to the past. Um, so we're gonna examine the pathway back to the way we're living or should we be conducting business and communing again in a very different um, way. During this series with the Kaimur Book Club, we will examine a way of thinking and envisioning the ambiguity of the future. We will identify ways to be equipped for the turbulence and the disruption of change. Uh, and, and, and this could be in whatever stage of life we are currently inhabiting. We'll be guided by our expert faculty who will join us each week over the next four weeks as we continue to read together and engage together in ways that we can build resilience and be better prepared um, and, and today we'll be hearing from the concept of the concept of full spectrum thinking. To date, I hear today that we have approximately 1200 registered participants from over 25 countries from around the world. Uh, so thank you for registering with the Think ND platform, which has been an absolute joy for us to work with. I will like to extend our gratitude to the sponsors of the Kaimur Book Club who have helped make this reality um, for um, the last four book clubs. It has been a real great pleasure, uh, as always, um, working with the Kyo Nocton Institute for Irish Studies, the College of Arts and Letters, the Kyo School of Global Affairs, Notre Dame Learning, uh, and this week, the Mendoza School of Business with our faculty who will be joining us today to give our um, talk. But of course, this all couldn't be done without the, the great, powerful lift of the Notre Dame um, alumni and family. This week we're going to format will be slightly different from our normal for formats. We will um, have a breakout session that we'll, we'll be utilizing the breakout session at the end of the session. This will give you um, a longer opportunity to, to meet your Velo Book Club participants, share your reflections of what you've heard today. And we've also thrown up some prompt questions that you could also discuss in your um, book club. Uh, breakout session. So I hope you enjoy the breakout sessions and uh, it'll just give you a time to, to meet everyone. Now we're going to use the chat function that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, this is where you'll be able to submit questions that I can moderate and feed to our faculty today. We'll try to answer as many as we can in the time that we've been allot allotted. But remember, if we don't get to all of them, we do have a private moderated discussion board on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Uh, and if you haven't joined it, I suggest that you join us on the Kaimur Book Club LinkedIn um, page so that we can continue the discussion and you can hear of all the good stuff that's continuing to go on at Kaimur and the wonderful suggestions of, re of, of reads of articles and books that we've been sharing with one another. So it is with great pleasure today that I welcome uh, Sam Miller for this live Zoom session. Sam is the Director of Undergraduate Studies for Innovation and Entrepreneurship and an Associate Teaching Professor at the University of Notre Dame Mendoza's College of Business, teaching coursework in entrepreneurship and strategic foresight at the undergraduate and graduate levels. Sam is founder and president of Proviant Corporation, a strategic foresight and innovation consultancy that provides training and exploratory research for companies and organizations seeking to understand and act upon emerging opportunities. Foresight clients have included organizations such as Microsoft, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Dairy Management, the Indiana Fiscal Policy Institute, and the Philippine government. In 2009, Sam was recognized as, as one of 21 people who would change business by Business Week. In 2015, Sam was recognized as one of the top 100 professors of entrepreneurship around the globe by Hot Topics. 
He is a member of the Association of Professional Futurists and World Future Studies Federation and has been a frequent speaker on sustainable innovation and entrepreneurship. We are really lucky to have Sam teaching his strategic foresight program for us at Kaimor, and he'll be joining us in the coming year. So when we are able to travel again, you are most welcome to, to apply to join us here at Kaimor, one of the programs that, Kyle, uh, that Sam will be teaching for us in Ireland, for all of you um, who are interested in seeing Kaimor. This is one of our open enrollment programs. Sam is with us today to discuss the setting the stage for future-oriented leadership. In his videos that he shared with us, we got to, re -listen to, uh, to read the great work of Bob Johansson in, in his book entitled The Full Spectrum Think Thinking. I welcome Sam today and thank you for joining us. Okay, and thank you. Uh, pleasure to be here, everybody. And um, uh, great to have the chance to share some thoughts on a particular uh, perspective on innovation. And uh, I think you'll enjoy it. I, I certainly do. And so I'm going to share my screen uh, quickly here and get us started. And so the topic for today's session and for the broader theme of the of the four uh, um, webinar series is anticipatory innovation. And, uh, and so this is uh, innovation that sort of aims to um, to look around the corner and see what's over the horizon. And, um, and so I stand on the shoulders of a couple of um, you know, really seasoned experts in the space. Uh, and the first is, uh, is a, um, a guy by the name of Bob Johansson. And uh, so he is a senior fellow at, a, um, at an organization called the Institute for the Future. They're in Palo Alto. Uh, and they do a, a terrific job of uh, of understanding long-term change and, uh, and uh, applying it in a way that's actionable. And so Bob has written a number of books, but his, um, his latest book is the third in uh, what became a trilogy on, um, on this sort of thinking. And so the first book, Leaders Make the Future, was about leadership skills. And then the, the second uh, in the series was about um, what he calls leadership literacies, the uh, uh, the competencies that enable leaders to, to um, you know, to, to implement those skills. And then this last one is sort of about how you think, how you, how you uh, observe and understand the world around you. And he calls it full spectrum thinking. And if you had a chance to watch the, uh, the, um, the introductory videos and read the pre-read, there's a couple of main takeaways, right, about around the uh, the, um, the human tendency to categorize and how that can interfere with, uh, with breakthrough innovation. And then uh, the distinction as we, as we actually seek to, uh, to move towards the future, the distinction between moving forward with clarity versus moving forward with what he calls certainty, which certainty can be uh, fragile and, and to a certain extent dangerous. And so we're gonna build on those and add in a little bit more context. We've left a lot of time for questions. So if there's something that prompts you to, you know, to uh, either challenge me on a, on a particular aspect from your experience uh, or ask for some you know, interpretation, we've got plenty of time for that on the back end. But the idea here is uh, around anticipatory innovation, which is innovation around um, what's next, okay? And, uh, and it's powerful, it's transformative innovation, but we have a tendency, especially at the enterprise level, um, of falling into some, uh, some, some sand traps, if you will, that constrain our understanding of possibilities. And you know, my, my go-to poster child example is Kodak, right? Here's a company that was as innovative as any American company or global company has ever been for a hundred years and was at the, um, at the top of the heap. They, uh, they were a $15 billion company. They were number 20 on the Fortune 500 for a while and, um, and had massive capacity and budget and resources for innovation. And yet here they are today, uh, just a shell of their former self. They had a, um, a you know, near death experience with bankruptcy uh, about a decade ago. And the, you know, how is it that a company that is that innovative and, and, has, and has done it for such a durable period of time, how do they fall into that, uh, into that um, uh, space where they, uh, 
where they they miss what's next by so much and and it, it aligns with this uh with the thoughts of, of bob johansson around categorization right the way we think about the system and the boundaries and the and the rules of the game that uh that it's almost like subliminal we don't even have to actively think about it it just uh it drives our uh, understanding and then it constrains it and if you think about the situation with Kodak, yes, they crashed and burned hard um, based on the, you know, the, the seismic shift towards digital photography. But the thing is, Kodak invented digital photography at huge expense with a long list of patents and, uh, and, and owned the, the, the key to the future. And yet, categorization led to this this uh, phenomenon we call capture right that that they deeply believed deep in the dna of the company and the enterprise and the and the culture not just that they were a film company which certainly that's what they believed and it wasn't just film they had uh, what they called the holy triad film paper and chemicals and it was this it, it was it was holy it, it, it achieved this level of existence that was spiritual. That's how deep it was in their understanding of who they were and why they existed. And even though they held the technology that was digital in the palm of their hand, they viewed themselves not just through the lens of the holy triad, but even more deeply that their business model was based on consumables. Sell people film, people use the film to capture images, take those uh, captured images, develop them with the chemicals, then print them uh, on the paper and then sell them more film and paper and chemicals. And, and in that context, in that worldview, deeply understood the uh, threats and challenges that they faced were more driven by a uh, young international uh, competitor that was trying to steal their market share uh, and that drove their understanding of what was urgent and necessary. And, um, and it was all done by the, the way that they had thought about the, uh, their role in the world. And, um, and a lot of people, I talk about this case study a lot, and a lot of people, you know, as they engage in the discussion, look at it in the context that Kodak was asleep at the switch. They failed to innovate, and as a consequence, they paid the price. And, and it's the exact opposite that's really true, right? They innovated like crazy they were spending a billion dollars a year on innovation, on R&D. And, uh, and what, but what were they innovating? They were innovating things that fit into the categorized worldview and understanding that the holy triad was indeed uh, the, uh, the, the durable system condition and that selling more consumables. So they created new film and cameras that were optimized for digital uh, uh, um, file storage. And, and they launched a, a line of, uh, of compact discs, right? There was a new technology and it was, it was high tech and it was well branded and it served the, the model, right? As a consumable, they created kiosks that you didn't have to go to a photo shop and, uh, uh, and, and leave your film. You could just um, um, take your negatives and, and print it out self-service using, of course, chemicals and paper from Kodak. And then even the uh, home, home printing uh, workstations that would allow you to use Kodak toner and Kodak paper to create professional high-end uh, resolution. And so they were innovating like crazy but they were innovating for yesterday's system condition. And it's this, it's this phenomenon that we call active inertia, right? Working as fast and as hard as you can in a way that doesn't yield forward momentum towards the future. And that's what happened to them. It was a question of, the, of what questions were they asking and what stories were they telling? And if, if they had been more anticipatory, rather than trying to come up with new consumables that would outmaneuver a company like Fuji, rather than imagining that they were a film processing company, what if they told a story of a different use case that that uh, made the case that uh, that photos were not dropped off at the at the film lab and picked up three days later, um, and and whatever the photo was, that's what it was, but rather a uh, photo editing story that 
would have allowed them to tell a story that looked a little bit like what Photoshop ended up uh, becoming the leader in, right? That that it it didn't take professionals well trained with tons of equipment to be a photo editor, right? That certainly professionals would continue to do it, but even school teachers and and kids and grandparents and everybody would have the ability to take photos in real time because they were digital, edit them, you know, put a title, uh, you know, uh, summer reunion 2021 or whatever, crop it and uh, and save it. And given that story, would Kodak have been well positioned, maybe change the colors on the logo to be the de facto leader in that space? Or how about the idea of, uh, of how we, uh, archived and appreciated the photos, and and back in the day when we you know picked up our prints from the from the uh, uh, the photo processor, a lot of times those ended up in a scrapbook, and uh, and then the scrapbook was preserved and archived, and we would get it out and share it with friends and relatives at special occasions, and that's how we uh, celebrated those moments of our life. And what if they told a story of not archiving it and putting it away on a dusty shelf? But rather sharing it, not with you know, with a with a small uh, cluster of friends and family, but with hundreds of friends in real time, and and then commenting and sharing and reposting and adding value to it. And if they had told that story, might they have been the gatekeeper of all of those images? Uh, and and the idea here is that both of those stories, now that we see them, make a lot of sense. But at the time, they were very what I, what I call cognitively distant. Right, that they didn't fit the model. They were they sounded a little bit absurd and a little bit ridiculous and and far fetched, but that's our challenge. Right, that that when we categorize, if you, if you uh, go back to Bob Johansson's notes, it sort of bounds our ability to understand and imagine these possibilities. And and anticipatory innovation pushes the limits to stretch the horizons on uh, on thinking about what these possibilities might be. And then we tell these stories, and it puts us in a position to open our lens to uh, to bigger ideas, to more disruptive and transformational ideas. One of my favorite books uh, is written by a guy by the name of Peter Thiel. He's a, a serial entrepreneur and uh, and um, and proven expert in the space. He uh, he was a founder of PayPal and uh, and is um, uh, you know runs in the crowd with uh, Elon Musk. sits on the board of um, of um, SpaceX and, and Tesla and uh, and his his most recent uh, uh, venture Palantir is a, a big data sort of uh, company out in um, you know cha changing the way that we use and understand uh, data and algorithms and that sort of thing and he and he write, wrote this book called Zero to One and he, in it he describes two types of innovation and I, I want to uh, really um, bring this point home that the the main type of innovation that we see around us all the time is what he calls horizontal innovation, right? He calls it um, one to N. You take something that exists and you enhance it and improve it. You make it faster and cheaper and better. And, uh, and, um, and that's the sort of innovation that happens every day in the businesses that, and, and, and products and markets that, um, uh, that we occupy. And, and the, the innovations are useful and they and they you know they turn the wheel on making things better but you wouldn't really call them transformative and this is the space that the incumbents occupy and it generally is within the box right these categories that we don't redefine markets necessarily we just improve the condition and and satisfaction in those markets transformational breakthrough innovation on the other hand is what uh, peter thiel calls vertical integration and uh, he calls it zero to one something doesn't exist and then because of the innovation it does and uh, and that's really where the the transformational possibilities come into uh, into play and and that requires us to blow up the boundaries on this uh, on the way our mind thinks about um, categories and uh, and all of the baggage that comes with that and so the two questions we ask is is it different? Or is it just better, right? And if it's better, then it's a then it's probably horizontal innovation, and it's probably not likely to uh, to be that transformational. If it's different, then it's a game changer, right? And uh, and there's all different ways to sort of try to interpret different versus better. But I like to look at it and say, you know, 10x, right? Does it change this situation by 10x, or does it change it by 10%? Um, and so that's the first question. And then given that 
uh, that first question, if you really are talking about something that is uh, that is so conceptual and uh, and and um, hard to fathom that it could actually uh, you know uh, become a mainstream solution, then you have to ask the question: Will anybody care? Will it matter? Will it actually lead to adoption and uh, and move towards mainstream? Will it make a difference? And uh, and that's the important question around anticipatory transformational innovation. In his book, uh, he talks about the problems of, um, uh, of competition in mature markets. And he says, all failed companies are the same. They've, they had their sites focused on outperforming the rivals in the, in the competitive sandbox and competition drove all of the, the um, uh, value creation opportunity down to zero. And uh, so keep that in mind that he, in order to do this, you have to have a full spectrum mindset. And that's what really what Bob Johansson uh, uh, sets up in the, in the first part of that uh, argument. So, so where do these vertical innovation opportunities come from? Well, they come from things that are novel, right? New needs and new priorities and, and new enabling technologies. And, uh, and we live on these these S curves, right? That early on when innovation comes along, it's small and it grows very slowly. It doesn't look like it's very meaningful. And then it accelerates and it amplifies and, and, it, and it works itself into the mainstream. And then somewhere in the middle, it hits an inflection point where instead of accelerating, it starts to decelerate and the market gets mature and innovation slows down and uh, and incremental innovation, right? The, uh, the horizontal in innovation starts to take over. And, um, and there's a serious place for innovation on the later stages of that S-curve, but it's not really done by breakthrough innovators. It's the, it's the core innovation that takes things and improves the quality and, and reduces the cost. And what we seek to do with anticipatory innovation is anticipate, understand, um, and, and become aware of the possibilities on the next S-curve, right? The, that transformational, that the, the, uh, the questions that we ask at the start of that emerging S-curve are very different than the questions that we would ask if we were instead deciding to surf on the later stages of the, uh, of the, um, uh, of the fading S-curve. And, and think about the, uh, the innovation that Kodak put in play relative to the, you know, the new storage devices and the new printing devices, those were, those were uh, innovations that served to do well on the later stages of that, uh, of that fading uh, expiring S curve. And the, the problem is that the new curve replaced the old curve. And, uh, and so what we need to do is, is understand the possibilities and ask different questions and tell those stories. So now we're in an entirely different sort of um, um, mode of thinking about how to manage that and how to uh, set expectations and lead our teams. And uh, where the idea here is to imagine these plausible paradigm shifts that can put us in a position to actually fund innovation and test and experiment and explore on the new S curve while we don't take our eyes off of our customers and our and our products and our margins and our and our business model on the prior S curve. So when we look at understanding um, and trying to envision these emerging needs, I, I I like to give it a little context, right? So, I mean, we, we probably all have used in one context or another, these, um, you know, products and innovations from Apple, and they've, you know, changed the game again and again, new S curve uh, again and again. And, and Steve Jobs makes the point that, that the, the beauty of their products, uh, their solutions, what they offer is that they're so elegantly designed, the user experience is so pleasing that we don't need a user manual, we don't need training classes and, uh, and that sort of thing, that we create this experience and then we backfill with the technology. And as much as I would never ever under any circumstances correct Steve Jobs, uh, what I think he meant to say is that what we need to do is anticipate 
the experience that the future user, this user that doesn't quite yet exist, who's trying to do jobs that are not quite yet known using technologies that are not quite ready for prime time. And, and that's the whole purpose uh, of, of how Apple innovated in a way that created a new way of consuming music and a new way of you know, imagining how we would use laptops and cell phones and, and again and again and again. And so it's challenging, right? Because of the categories that we, that we have trained and been trained by the, the world around us uh, to understand and, and, uh, and take a second nature, right? Henry Ford was, was you know, uh, famously answered the question of, Henry, do you do much market research? And, and he said, my ideas are so cognitively distant. Now, I don't think he used that language, but they're so out of uh, bounds of the existing assumptions and categories that people wouldn't understand what the possibilities are. And I need to help lead the way. That's the challenge, right? And uh, that if I asked them what they need in a world that was horse centric, their answers would have been uh, told in the language of horses. Same as Kodak's language, you know, what leveraged consumables and, and, uh, and, and, and printed pictures. And uh, in a world that was about to eliminate the need for just about all of the consumables. And think about this, that uh, if back in the day, if Steve Jobs would have put together a focus group of music users who were using Sony Walkman, now there was a zero to one innovation that was pretty cool, but was about to fade away with the advent of uh, digital um, you know, music exchange and ask them, hey, you know, tell me what you need and we'll design it. Look at this panel of designers. Tell us uh, what you hate, what your, you know, what your complaints are and, and let us run. Uh, what kinds of things do we imagine they would have told us? Well, they probably would have been talking about things like, you know, more song capacity or longer battery storage or make it smaller. Are you, I, you know, you say I can go jogging with it, but if the, you know, it's like wearing a, you know, a small suitcase on my hip, uh, those sorts of things. How many of them do you think would have said, well, Steve, now that you ask, what I really would like is iTunes, right? But they wouldn't have understood that possibility. That's what anticipatory innovation uh, needs us to, uh, to embrace. And, uh, and so in order to do that, we don't just you know, watch science fiction and come up with big, crazy ideas. What we need to do is learn and observe uh, and understand what's around, right? That the, you know, every company has product plans and, and, uh, and, um, and, and uh, roadmaps and that sort of thing. And the idea is that a plan is probably already obsolete by the time it's presented, uh, but the planning process, the way that you think about it and, uh, and build resilience and adaptation into that uh, kind of living document is, is essential, right? And um, in the uh, in one of the earlier uh, prep videos, I talked about uh, the uh, former CEO of uh, P and G, guy by the name of Arthur um, um, Lafley, is um, uh, talks about that the uh, fastest learner wins, right? And so, not just having the capacity and the culture and the and the expectation of doing great strategic planning but doing strategic learning, spotting those weak signals at the very earliest stages of an emerging S-curve before anybody sees it is really essential. And so what is it that allows us to become learning companies? And this is from Bob Johansson. Uh, and it, um, you know, what are the things, the best practices, the things that learning organizations are really great at? Well, the first is they make time for thinking about and imagining and, uh, and, uh, and immersing themselves in the long-term future. And they protect that time, they defend it. If you think about it, you know, there's basically two modes of business. Hey, we are so busy that we gotta go all hands on deck and get, you know, build and ship everything we can by the end of this quarter so we can, you know, exceed our numbers and everyone get a nice bonus. And so let's, anything that doesn't end by this quarter, we'll talk about that at some later time. Or, well, you know what, things are slowing down, we got to get lean and mean and, uh, and we can't talk about this, you know, this stuff that uh, is not mission critical and essential. So we'll come back to that when the time is right. And, and the time is, neither, is right in neither of those situations, right? And learning companies defend that time. And, 
uh, and they, they do it regularly and they do it with their most important people um, and they do it uh, without fail. They develop the competencies, right, in terms of the skills and the uh, and the expectations and the uh, and the things they measure and the uh, and the meeting rhythms and and all of those sorts of things that allow room for weak signals that are that are brought in from the periphery uh, to uh, to get some oxygen and be talked about and. Uh, and analyzed, and it becomes cultural. It becomes part of the DNA of the of the management philosophy and what they uh, what they talk about and what they expect and what they have uh, plugged into their meeting rhythms and that sort of thing. They expand their temporal time horizon, right? I mean, it, you know, if you work for a, for a large enterprise uh, or even a smaller medium enterprise, right? The uh, you know the weekly, monthly, quarterly. Uh, expectations just drive all of the decisions, right? And they have a uh, uh, the capacity to think in terms of you know uh, five to ten year increments in ways that uh, that allow those possibilities to bubble back into uh, the you know the current decision making and uh, and not just the time horizon, but the uh, the peripheral vision they bring, right? That they they're not just focused on their core customer and their core market and their core uh, products. But they're listening and looking for those signals on the, uh, you know, on the periphery that might be um, adjacencies or other things that bring in uh, different sorts of understanding and really powerfully inform innovation. And finally, uh, they seek out and, and embrace situations where they don't know what they don't know, right? That's, you know, so much of our, our management paradigm is to you know, squeeze out uncertainty to, you know, to almost zero and, uh, and, uh, and, and make your commitments and then deliver on those commitments and learning companies do a really good job of, um, of you know, bringing things in where they don't understand the answer, but there's, there's meaningful content there. And so I think this is useful perspective. Um, and again, how do we find these, these interesting signals, right? These, these signals from the periphery where we don't, understand what they mean just yet, but we know enough about them to bring them back into the into the boardroom and into the uh, management uh, decision making and that sort of thing. And the answer is that all of the signals, all of the clues of what the future has in store are all around us. They're everywhere. William Gibson, a, uh, a science fiction writer, is famously uh, quoted for saying, uh, you know, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And there's so many examples of, um, of how weak signals uh, amplified into the next generation of mainstream solutions. And uh, I, I always finish with this, with this quote. So Albert von St. Georgi is a, um, he's a Hungarian, a, a, a European Nobel laureate. And he was a, um, he was a, uh, a scientist. At, um, uh, and so discovery in his, in his context was, you know, uh, in, a, in a science lab with, you know, test tubes and and petri dishes and I don't know oscilloscopes and, and and those sorts of things. But in the product development in the innovation space, discovery is the first stage in the stage gate process. It's an exploratory stage, and I think this is a profound statement that that discovery happens when somebody looks out at the world that everybody else can see and sees all of the signals, but decategorizes them, changes the way that we uh, we understand and interpret them to imagine something that nobody has before imagined. And, uh, and so that gets us to the, you know, to, the, to the second aspect that Bob Johansson is an advocate for, and that is to proceed with, with clarity, right? Understanding of, of what might uh, happen filled with ambiguity and uncertainty, but it's sort of a North Star as opposed to certainty, right? That certainty can be fragile, uh, and is very unforgiving uh, if the system conditions change. Kodak had high certainty about the technical specs and the and the uh, uh, and the you know, market testing around their various products up until the whole thing shifted. And uh, and so that's what I have for you today. Uh, I'm happy to open it up. You know, I appreciate everybody's attention and uh, and welcome the uh, you know the the um, the questions that we might have. Thanks, Sam. 
Um, that was really wonderful and appreciate um, the slides too, because it really gives us a sense with the, with the S curve. I do have a question with regards that you, since you did mention um, Steve Jobs and Apple, um, one of the questions that we did have was, um, was the way like Steve Jobs even like approached asking questions. And there's this like kind of story of, the, of, of, you know, he was so against the iPhone really, right? There's this story where, but it, it, it took his like engineers and his scientists to, you know, ask him provocative questions and, and kind of put these kind of ideas into his head as to what the potential of the iPhone could be. Um, so, uh, the, you know, what we heard from Johansson's chapters, like the way we, in which we approach asking questions is very important and it gives us a new opportunity or a new avenue to rethink problems. Um, so if we looked at the case of BlackBerry versus the iPhone, I, I you know, like BlackBerry couldn't simply rethink their screen they were so tied to that alphabet being on the screen in that format which sort of left them behind not dissimilar to what you suggested with Kodak and yet with Steve Jobs and the way he formulated his company and the way they kind of asked the right questions they were able to rethink that that very pivotal component of the screen uh, so I suppose, I, I wonder what, what did you think that, that held BlackBerry back? Like what, and so what is the example of, of asking the wrong questions and, and, and why do you think Apple did it, did it right? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of layers to that question and, I, and I'll try to share some perspective. I think that if you were going to talk about the dangers of categorization and, um, and the constraints that hold us back within the, um, uh, in the sandbox. Uh, Blackberry is as good of an example as you're going to find, maybe even more profound than, than Kodak and film. Um, and uh, there was nothing wrong with the technology and the usability and the, and, the, uh, and the customer satisfaction with Blackberry. And they held onto that curve so tight, right? Believing because they, in, they invented that curve and they, you know, I mean, and those things were, were such a huge success that they, you know, they were, they were, they were called crackberries, right? I mean, they were like addictive and, um, but the questions that I think the, the signals that Apple paid attention to, and then the questions and stories that app that led Apple to, I mean, most people looked at Apple and said, what are you crazy going into the, to the phone business? Uh, you're going to get killed. And, and, and the same uh, thing they said when Apple decided to go into retail, what are you nuts? You know, stay online. You're, you're, you have your own little market niche. Don't go try to, and, they, and in both instances, they said, we're not going to do it that way. And the stories they told were totally different, right? That, that they basically invented new language, right? That up until the day that this thing launched, Right. And, and oh, by the way, this thing launched the day it launched, it had 151 patents either uh, issued or filed for into a mature sector. There was breakthrough stuff going on. But on the day before it launched, an app had a totally different meaning. It was like something that was, you know, on special two for one at TGI Fridays at happy hour sort of thing. Right. Uh, that before they launched the uh, the, um, the Macintosh, a mouse was a rodent that you called the exterminator for. Uh, um, the uh, retail, the, the, you know, the, the Apple store, where you have to like, you know, uh, have super cheap and, and uh, cost effective people and clerks in your stores, and they, they call them geniuses. They change the language, they change the whole expectation in the story. And the other thing I think is uh, that, that matters is going back to that sensing of signals and understanding of signals, right? And, and digital music, uh, the, the iPod was not that transformative. There were other MP3 players, it was cool. And it, I mean, it, and, it, and it, the sexy design and everything, um, and it fit with what Apple was. Apple was a computer company. It was sort of within the categories of what Apple was. The big transformational breakthrough was not the iPod. It came from a weak signal that was being whispered millions of times a minute 
uh, that changed the whole game. And and so they they looked at that space that was the uh, you know Sony Walkman, and they noticed that. So at the time, people weren't downloading digitally. They were using physical media. First, it was cassette tapes, and then it was uh, and then it was um, CDs. But what the users were actually putting in there, the behavior, was not an album that they bought at Tower Records, 17 songs that, you know, uh, played for 43 minutes. What they noticed was that the users were creating their own mixtapes and burning a disc and putting that mixtape in what they were whispering millions of times a minute that was overwhelming if you were listening to it, was the market saying, I want to buy one song at a time. I want to pick my songs one at a time. And that was the thing that, uh, that was the vertical integration, right? And that was the thing that, that people pushed back on Apple. They're like, you can't do that. The system doesn't work that way. Whether it was the performers, uh, you know, or the, or the producers or the, or the music distribution, that's where the transformation happened. And anyone that was paying attention, you know, they go go back to the uh, to the Albert von St. Georgi quote. Everyone could see that. Everyone did see it. Most of the people were doing it. They didn't understand the meaning that changed the game. And that's what anticipatory innovators do. They they understand those signals. And and it wasn't just like they it popped up and okay that's done. No, I mean they didn't know what it meant. They explored and they tested and they uh, and they told and they told the stories of of this future user. Well, it is interesting that the consumer wanted control in the music industry. It sounds like they wanted to have that control to make their own album. I would ask the follow up question to that. Then Sam is is now you have and, and Joe Hansen talks is about the new generation that's you know that's that's crossing boundaries and is is looking at different. Um, I guess different markets, and, and they're and they're multiple kind of dimensional, right? They 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 cross a kind of multiple subject areas as well. It sounds like there's a, a throwback though now with 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 records and albums, right? There's there's actually now in a way the iPhone sacrificed the quality of the music, and now we have this kind of throwback. And if we're listening to the signals now, albums. Uh, and and the quality of music is becoming something that's that's of high priority for for a younger generation coming through. I wonder if you have a comment for that. Yeah, so um, nostalgia is powerful, but I think it generally will always be a niche, right? That, uh, um, but along that same thing, we had all of these iPods and the little earbuds and that sort of thing. Uh, and there was a breakthrough innovation that, that came through that changed that, and that was Beats, right, which Apple ended up buying. And that was uh, a musician got together with an industrial designer and said, these headphones suck. I create this music that's supposed to, like, shake your soul, and then it's all tin, and, and you, you know, uh, and, uh, and they challenged all of the assumptions and said, People don't want these little itty bitty teeny tiny things. They want to feel the bass going, you know, right through their their whole world. And uh, and and Beats came and again changed uh, changed the expectation by challenging those assumptions. They got out of the categorization that started with the remember the little foam, you know, uh, uh, Sony Walkman, and then became the you know the earbuds and. Um, uh, and the generation before was these big clunky, you know, uh, almost like, you know, uh, astronaut spacesuit uh, headphones. And, um, and Beats brought those back and made them cool again. And, um, and so I think there's, the, the, you know, the, um, uh, the, the old uh, uh, Mark Twain quote that uh, history may not repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes, right? And that's where yes. I think that nostalgia can sort of inform future use cases. Okay, I have a question that came in through the chat, uh, Sam. It is not surprising that the pandemic quickened the demise of many brick and mortar stores closed. However, digital tech was already extremely popular 
pre-pandemic. Therefore, it seems likely retailers should have been more anticipatory in sales, mo sales models. In that sense, Amazon was looking forward. What mistakes or missteps did storied old money retailers make in thinking that stores crammed with merchandise that ages out before it sells would last forever? Yeah, I mean, the, um, the interesting thing is, so I, I do strategic foresight and, and, uh, and read a lot of foresight reports and participate in futures research and that sort of thing. And every futures report I've seen since the 70s and forward uh, mentioned the possibility of a pandemic, right, as a wild card event. It wasn't like, oh my goodness, we never realized that could happen. But we never really asked what it would mean. And um, and it's not just the bricks and mortar retailers. Uh, you know, it's it's everybody. It's um, uh, it's the you know remote remote working, and it's the education, and it's the healthcare sector, and uh, um, and and that sort of thing. And that's just the uh, the challenge. We'll talk more about this in the uh, in the prep videos and the webinar coming up on how do you balance both sides of your need to innovate, right? The core innovation that happens on the existing S curve. Uh, with still giving some latitude uh, and, uh, and and momentum to the breakthrough, uh, but when you get into a mature business, then it's inevitable that the uh, the number of competitors shrinks, their power increases, margins get squeezed, and it becomes a question of optimization and efficiency, right? And uh, and you squeeze everything out, uh, and um, and, you know, when that's driving decision making, whether you're a public company or not, uh, then you make decisions based on certainty. And those decisions work really well until the, you know, the legs underneath that cart uh, get, get, um, get knocked out. And then, and then it gets fragile. And that's what happened. Uh, I think that um, uh, certainly uh, Amazon and uh, uh, and Uber and Zoom and others certainly surfed that new curve, but I think history, will, when they look back, will realize that to a great extent they were just the right place at the right time, um, and um, and they better be planning for what comes next. I've already seen uh, you know different possibilities of what will replace Zoom, um, and uh and right now we're accustomed to it right we get better at using zoom or our companies negotiate better contracts to use zoom but what comes next will make zoom look you know um, pretty silly uh in the in the grand scheme and and i think that's what we're talking about that you know old line uh retailers that you know were respected well-managed companies just uh um they were fragile same as blockbuster was right I mean, Blockbuster was as good at retail as any company's ever been. The, these guys, think about this. How would you like to be the, the, the person responsible uh, reporting to the you know, chief operating officer at Amazon for guaranteed in stock, which means that sometime around Thursday or maybe Wednesday night, you had to tell corporate wide 5,000 stores what they had to have on the shelf Friday afternoon that they couldn't run out of what might be popular this week, such that we will back it up with a guarantee. And they pulled that off. I mean, that is no small feat, but what good did it do them next time around, right? It, uh, um, and I, th I think that there's lots of examples of, uh, of that happening in lots of spaces, right? I mean, you look at our healthcare and our and our education and our finance and our and our manufacturing it's not just retail uh it's everywhere that that being great at yesterday's game m might be a very unfortunate place to be uh, mary mary best has a question um uh, to kind of speaking to my earlier comment about the reemergence of records in the digital music industry um her example she's using is the prediction that ebooks and i was a part of the publishing industry at that time when we thought the ebook was going to take over every you know take over books and we were no longer actually going to have the printed word anymore um but instead uh, of it being a, just a nostalgic factor um mary argues it would be it, it it speaks to the basic human need for you know uh tangibility and visceral 
reality. How much do you think considering how humans work should be a part of anticipatory innovation? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's not just uh, books, it's, um, it's paper money, right? And it's, uh, and it's newspapers and that, that, uh, that if you grew up a certain way, you like reading a novel with the smell of the book and sitting on the, you know, on the bench outside at the cabin and that sort of thing. Uh, I think that one of the things that goes back to that categorization thing, uh, pay special attention and, and be careful not to be dismissive of the rising generation, right? Uh, you know, that, um, uh, that if you are in high school right now, you may never have had a physical textbook, right? And uh, uh, that everything was delivered electronically and on iPads and that sort of thing. And, uh, and those 16 year olds are gonna be 26 pretty soon and they're going to have spending power and they're going to, uh, and, they're, and they're gonna have influence. And, um, and so sometimes the people making the decisions are more seasoned and, uh, and have those, those biases around, you know, the, the sort of cultural and experiential sort of thing of the good old days. Uh, so pay close attention to the, uh, the, the people that are doing things that seem just like, you know, uh, so unconventional, you wish they would cut it out, right? Or why do you, why do you talk like that's the way of the future? What do you know? Um, that, that those are the, those are the, uh, behavior patterns that are going to move into uh, the ma mature things uh, um, and recognize that uh, that things proceed slowly until you hit a tipping point. Uh, and, uh, and, and COVID was a tipping point, right? Uh, uh, I used to read my Wall Street Journal in the paper edition first thing every morning. And if it didn't come, I was on the phone yelling at somebody. And then uh, the, you know, COVID came and, you know, not only wouldn't they deliver it to my mail room, I get it delivered here to Mendoza on campus. Not only wouldn't they deliver it there, but I wasn't allowed in the mail room to pick it up. And, uh, and suddenly I paid closer attention to making sure that my, uh, online subscription worked. Uh, and so now we're back on campus. It's a spring semester. And after the spring last year, and then, uh, and then the fall, they, um, they decided, hey, you know what, we're going to um, start re-delivering all of these um, uh, physical products. And uh, so, you know, click here to, uh, to start that back up again. I loved my paper. I couldn't live without it. I held it in my hands. I cut it out and put it in folders. You know what I said? No, thank you. I'm good. Right. And so so uh, behavior and perceptions and preferences are very sticky until we reach a tipping point. Right. And and I think you can think about that in terms of internal combustion engines. I think you can think about it in terms of uh, renewable energy. I think you can think about it in terms of an awful lot of uh, uh, of business models and use cases that we're just accustomed to until all of a sudden we just, you know, there's uh, the, the curves intersect, the, the, the expiring S, X, S curve and the new one intersect. And suddenly, you know, there's no logical reason to go back to that old way. And now certain people will, right? The, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the late adopters will go kicking and screaming. Um, I well, don't I, see the I don't see the end of the book quite yet though. The the paper book, the paperback or it will still be very useful at the beach and in the bathroom. Um Sam, another question with regards to categorization that uh, Johansson put so eloquently in the chapter that you had assigned for the for the week. Categorization seems almost instinctual, right? As, as he writes, it's imparted to us from our childhood. I think you can even identify writers such as J.K. Rowling, who had that sorting hat, you know, to distinguish students into their appropriate houses. Uh, psychology uses a variety of testings from the early days of the Myers-Briggs to what we use now in exec ed 360s. Um, why is categorization integral to us as our societal, societal beings? You know, it tends to polarize. We talk about polarities a lot. And what ways to avoid such impulses that seem unconscious? 
Yeah, I, I mean, there's that, that's a very deep question, and there's there's a lot of people that spend a lot of time researching that. Uh, I think that part of it is evolutionary, right? That um, uh, that we uh, we allow these these metaphors and these assumptions and these um, and these categories to do a lot of the heavy lifting, right? That um, you know, it, it, as we were evolving from the uh, you know the savanna. Uh, when we heard a roar, we didn't, you know, do a bunch of analysis. We knew what it meant, right? And and then it got a little bit deeper. That well, uh, um, and and our 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 minds. I actually do a lecture on this. Um, uh, that our minds learned and evolved to process information in a way that we that we uh, got good at accepting probably approximately correct. For a lot of the decisions we make, and, and that and that and that factors into that, right? That that we knew that you know when the days start to get short, there's probably water that we can rely on, approximately in that direction. So we go, right? And uh, we didn't know for sure, and. Uh, and anticipatory innovation, the stories and, and, and possibilities that we imagine on those emerging S-curves, we need to, as leaders and as innovators, get good at being comfortable with probably approximately correct, right? And not in everything, right? That if I, uh, you know, if I'm getting audited on my taxes and the, and the tax man says, all right, Miller, uh, we're tearing into this, are these factually correct, if I say, well, probably, approximately, I'm probably going to have a long day, right? You know, and, and whether we're talking about quality or safety or, you know, uh, or, or those sorts of things, we have to have certainty. But clarity is probably approximately correct. And, um, but there's a reason that our minds evolved, our, our brains evolved, our, our uh, our relationships and and uh, and ability to collaborate and exchange value uh, that we understand that we can trust those systems and and that sort of thing. But that's a really deep question. There is a book called Probably Approximately Correct uh, that is written in the language of um, how to build better artificial intelligence. I don't really recommend it for the casual reader. Uh, every couple of years, I go back to it, and it's just brutally painful because it's. But the, but the high level concept, right? That that if we um, uh, that probably approximately correct allows us to learn, and and then um, and then improve, right? And uh, and enhance, and uh, in a similar way that in the entrepreneurial space we deal with like minimally viable products and that sort of thing. A minimally viable innovation is probably something close to what somebody might like. Let's build it and show it to them and see what they like and see what they hate. And, um, um, and, and so that idea that those, uh, those metaphors and those, and those categories can really be useful for certain things uh, goes way, way back in human evolution. Well, thanks, Sam. That that hour went quickly, actually, uh, despite me thinking that we would need more time. We did, we had too much time. I'm so happy that we had this conversation and I appreciate um, uh, your words of wisdom that you imparted today. Um, as I said before, Sam's teaching for us in our um, strategic foresight workshop that we're hosting at Kymer in the upcoming fall and into 2022. I want to, again, thank you for your time. Sam will be here again on, a, uh, on another session for this particular book club uh, on our fourth week. Next week, we have Melvin, Dr. Melvin Dowdy, who is a, a polymath, I suppose, in, in that he's a poet, a psychologist. <laughs> he's also um, a coach. And um, he's been working with us in exec ed for um, a number of years. So he'll be with us next week, sharing some of the poetry that he's written, as well as um, his, um, his uh, concept of interpreting po po polarity. So keeping, keeping in line with our um, anticipatory um, innovation topic. So um, 
The next stage is now a breakout session for you all. If you'd like to join, um, we're, uh, Zoe will be zooming you into little breakout sessions where you'll get the opportunity to chat amongst yourselves. We have some discussion questions that we will be putting up into the main screen. So if you wanted to use those, but what I uh, encourage you to do is, um, is to use civil discourse and to introduce yourselves and just take this opportunity to meet people from around the world and um, have a chat. Um, and if we, um, I look forward to seeing, if we don't see you in the chat room, I look forward to seeing you next week, next Wednesday with Mel. Um, and for those of you who are interested, we are having, um, we do this for our students, um, uh, a, a cook along and teaching students on how to cook. Um, David, our chef at Kyle Moore is doing um, a step along cook along and you're more than welcome to join. It's free, it's online and it's for Valentine's. We'll have students online and we will have um, anyone who's interested in just cooking along where this is where you pick up your ingredients and you just join us at Kyle Moore and our chef who's uh, classically trained in French cuisine, will be teaching us to the, the ever elusive mushroom and truffle risotto. For those of you who are interested in joining us on Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Well, thanks again, Sam. And we'll um, break out into breakout rooms now. So thanks and see you soon.